Welcome to the Susan Brender Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your very best. And now, here's Susan Brender. I'm Susan Brender, and this is the Susan Brender Show. Today, my guest is Laurieann Davis, a mom, author, and divorce advocate who lives in New York with her 15-year-old son, Severo, and her dog, Pupsy. She's been a single mom for 12 years and teaches acting, yoga, music movement to children daily, writes plays, songs, poetry, and is the co-author of Finally Monologues That Work and the author of the soon-to-be-released Finally, Scenes That Work. Storm of Colors is her first children's book. Now I want to welcome to the Susan Brender Show, Laurieann Davis. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. You know, you and I did a show before, and we talked about so many things. So let's follow up on what's going on now. So I would like, Lori, to tell me um, the experience of going through a long and stressful divorce um, left your son stuck in the middle of two hurt, angry, divorcing parents and a court system who would not allow it to end. Now, Lori, what was that like? I'm sorry to have to ask you to bring up this very sad story, but um, I think it's important for our audience to know. Oh, absolutely. Um, it is. It is painful. It is sad. But the reason why I do talk about it is because I wanted the people to hear this story so that they don't repeat what we did because it's really too late um, to go back in time and fix some of the things um, that I wish I could fix or things that I knew, actually the things that I know now that I could retrace. Um, it was really, really difficult. My son was four years old, and um, there, it wasn't about not being in love. It was just two people that just couldn't agree on raising a child and other issues, financial, emotional, and we kind of got the best of us and ended up going through this divorce process, and I don't think either of us at the time realized how difficult it was going to be. We started off with a mediator and somehow ended up in the divorce court system. And sometimes it's even hard to describe how we ended up there. Just not just disagreements on things, um, more so on my husband's part, because he was holding on to a lot of things financially. And lawyers like that. They like when there's money involved, when maybe the other person is has more money or a lot of money to spend. So they kind of keep it going. And it's been doctors into court dates and hours and hours spent in the court and the stress and anxiety. And eventually your health breaks down, as did mine. And all the while there's this beautiful child, or maybe some people have a few children, that are looking to you to continue on with a safe and um, consistent life. And mm-hmm. we were the ones that left the house because we had to. So my son was brought into a new town, into a new home, um, not in his room anymore, and eventually, even though he was a very bright, strong little boy, he broke down. Yeah. He yeah. really did. And um, in the beginning, you know, you, you don't notice as much because you're still at the playful age where, you know, they're not verbalizing, like aren't able to say their words. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Mommy, I'm hurt. Mommy, I'm feeling this. Or Daddy, please stop. Mommy, please stop. They don't know how to say it. But how the book came about for me, Storm of Colors, was I asked my son one day, how does it feel like – you know, going back and forth to mommies and daddies and, and maybe daddy's late and feeling disappointed that you can't be with both of us. And he said to me, I feel like I'm in a storm. And I, he was five years old at the time. Said, he said that mean? word? He yeah, said that word, I feel storm. like I'm in a storm. Wow. And I said, what do you mean? First he mentioned being in a rainstorm. I said, well, it's raining on you, the wind is whipping. And he said, no, there's just all these colors all around me. And and I, I'm just confused. You still always say I'm confused. And as he got older and I asked him more questions about that, he held on to that feeling. And he said it just felt like he didn't know which ones to go towards, almost like going over a rainbow. Should you go towards the good colors or the dark colors? Mm-hmm. And at first I didn't understand, but now that he's 15, he can verbalize, of course. Um, he used to also describe it as kind of like those little – uh, little peanut packages that you pack things with that they go back and forth like they get switched up to packages that's how you used to always say it like I feel like that one little peanut that keeps getting thrown back into the box Yeah. and emotionally it has done so much damage I mean my son ended up with severe anxiety eventually um, certain fears that probably wouldn't have developed had we not been going through this process and watching me cry and um, as strong as I was and going back into court, like I said, like every day, and not wow. coming up with answers, mm-hmm. and the anger between the two parents. 
um, and I'm guilty of it too, and I'd like mm-hmm. to think even as a teacher and a mom that I did a lot of the right things, but sometimes when your child comes home and they say things that they saw or things that happened, you tend to say, oh, you know what, your your dad's a jerk or mm-hmm. your mom is, is, is just in it for the money or whatever. Mm-hmm. And those things are being heard by the child, no matter how much you try to shield them from it. Mm-hmm. Now, Lori, let me ask you, um, it's said that there is about 50% of the population uh, who are married get divorced. Now, do you think it's better to stay in a marriage for the children um, until the children can kind of figure it all out and and um, do you, or do you think that it's just better to to leave and to separate like you did? Wow, that's such a good question. So I was just thinking about someone that I know who actually did wait, you know, after a very long marriage, and the kids were in their twenties and grown to you know move away from the relationship. And I thought, okay, how what great like what a great you know parent that they they were able to stick it out. Um, but at the same time. To be in a marriage where you're not getting along and there's constant bickering and, and no love, you know, I don't think that's a good thing either. Mm-hmm. But I'm hoping that um, before people make that decision, they do go to therapy, they do reach out and get help. And whether it's find a program like the one I'm doing or another one that involves the school and people around them, so they can make that decision. Right. I personally would love to see people stay married. There's a reason why you got married. You fell in love. Mm-hmm. And now watching my ex-husband going through a second divorce, we really could step back and see what we where what you know what we did wrong or maybe where things went wrong. Right. Because you there's always the love base. So it's such a kind of it's a hard question to answer. Me personally, I would say try to stay together. Find what made you fall in love with that person and remember that there's children involved. Um yeah. but if it's if it's you know, a situation where there's abuse and other things, alcoholism going on, there's, you have to get out. You really do, sometimes to keep yourself safe and your children safe. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you learned uh, during this episode, I'll call it an episode, um, are, do you have some advice for our audience? I mean, look at look at the situation right now. Children are learning to cope but their lives are changing in so many ways. And so you've had so much experience with the divorce situation and writing a book and seeing your son suffer. So what would you tell our audience? Um, uh, would you give them advice? What kind of advice would you give? Keep your family together. You don't have to be in the same house and you don't have to be in love anymore. But keep your family together. Um, it's so important to... You could be a new family. You don't have to be the same family. You just it's it's something new, it's something different. And and we go through different things in our lives and changes. Our children go through all kinds of changes. Sometimes it's an accident. There's there's different changes in school environment. It happens. Um of course watching their family break up in that way is not as easy, but that's why why let it break up. You mm-hmm. could still be friends. You could still even if you can't stand each other, remember that there's these beautiful little children, these prizes that you created together that need you. So why not just create a new family dynamic? Mm-hmm. So if you can separate more easily and you both have a safe, clean place to live financially, if you can do that, then make the transition nice where maybe you can get together once a month as a family and have dinner. Even if you have new spouses or new wives. I know people that that actually you know, like the the uh, new spouses, and they get together, and they find things to like about each other as a group, and they, they, they co-parent. Mm. Co-parenting is so important, and now I'm saying co-family. Wow. Do both. Keep it together and explain to your children it's going to be a little different, but mommy and daddy still care about each other, and most importantly, we love you. Mm-hmm. You're wonderful and great, and we're just going to have a new way of doing things. Yeah, ah, that's interesting. Now, let me let me talk about schools. Now, you've implemented um, in schools around the country, as well in divorce court, uh, a program. Did you not? Well, I'm working on it right now. That's the goal is to is to get it out to the masses. Right now, I'm of course bringing it to my my local area, my town, my county. Well, because it's so bad here. <laughs> you know, now tell our audience about this program that you're um, that you're creating now for schools, because I want to know how much should the schools be involved when there is this kind of situation where there's divorce and the children are starting to act out. Well, they absolutely should be involved. As a preschool teacher myself, a music teacher, and an acting teacher, 
um, when I would go into a classroom and I noticed a child wasn't behaving properly or maybe acting out in a different way, they used to always say, why don't you find out if there's something going on with the with the parents, with the marriage? Because almost, I would say, 80 to 90 percent, that's what it was. Hmm. Because they were having trouble adjusting and, you know, the teacher was maybe disciplining them or giving them things to do when that wasn't going to work. Yeah. They needed to, to verbalize. Even if it's somebody, a child as little as uh, three years old, they still need, you know, a way to verbalize it or physicalize what they're feeling. Now, schools have cut so many programs because of financial uh, disadvantage that they have in this society, which is really unbelievable that they have this problem. But um, is it the teacher's responsibility, or would you recommend if they have somebody in social services working with the kids? I think it's. I think it goes beyond that. I think. Um, a lot of schools, they you know, they say they don't have funding, but there's also um, other programs where they get money from. Where with our county, we have BOCES um, with the PTA, and they raise money. So there's ways to. My program is very cost effective, and if you go in and you work alongside with the school social, social worker, you could really save a lot of money instead of bringing in somebody private, mm-hmm. so that the the children have the uh, backup. But as far as like. Um, you know, the the town or the state getting involved, they're trained in a certain way. What my program does is help the children literally get out their emotions in a safe environment, in a role-playing type of environment, using acting exercises and theater games. And the goal of the workshop is to help them adjust with their changing family environment through the freedom of expression. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Lori, let me ask you some, something else, and that is that we live in a melting pot you know, America's a melting pot, and so is the rest of the world now. Now, the program that you developed and the program that you think would work for one kind of um, ethnicity, does it work for all all children? Because look at look at our schools now. When you walk around, you see Latinos, you see Muslims, you see Jews, you see Christians, you see people from all over the world. Would this program work for children who are, have a different perspective because of their cultural uh, upbringing? Yes, absolutely, because no matter how we are culturally or or any other form, um, religion-wise, it still comes down to family. Your family is breaking up, and they still need to be able to articulate those emotions and those feelings, and the parents need to be involved. In my program, they are involved. They 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 actually get to work with the children. They get sent home information. They're brought into it, even if it's to see their. They actually do a little performance at the end where they act out their feelings and they get to write scenes. And it's all what their words, their emotions, and the parents are involved in that. And they get to actually see what's happening. They're also given a bracelet um, that they, they could wear so that if they don't have the words that they can't use, stop mom or dad or this is not making me feel good, they just have to hold up their wrist so the parents are told about it. So that if they see that arm go up and they see the bracelet on their hand, they know that what they're doing is hurting their child. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, again, it doesn't matter, who, even if your your income, if it depends on the school that I would be working with, it would be um, – geared towards that particular group right. or as close to it, depending on what their situation was. And the, I would say, I sit down with the children and I ask them questions, and then the program is based on that mm-hmm. and how they're feeling. It's not a cookie-cutter thing like you are gonna you get a ditto like they do in some of the programs, um, which I won't mention, but my son was involved with some of them, and they send him home with these papers and, and, and to fill out these things and do homework, and they sit at the table. They don't ever get up. They don't get to move. They don't get to express themselves. Mm-hmm. My, mine is like a 12-week program, and you co- can coordinate it with a therapeutic program within the school, and they get to learn uh, breathing methods, meditation, guided imagery, relaxation and stress release techniques, so that they can understand that when a situation happens, you know, do I go to the right or do I go to the left? Mm -hmm. They can actually be able to make those decisions. Again, as little as three or four years old, they learn how to breathe. They learn how to relax their body. We do body movement and dance so that they don't feel too much inhibition, that they could just kind of let themselves go and strengthen their self-esteem. Hmm. Now, the programs that you are de- that you developed, um, is it different for different ages? So, for example, you were talking about movement and music and um, and the discussions that you have with the kids. Does that apply to a 
children across the board, no matter how old they are, or is it different for different groups? Well, the little ones, more of the toddler age, the um, in preschool, probably up to about six years old, it's very much about the movement and using their bodies through music and song. Um, and because they, you know they can't read yet, so some of the words are you know they'll they'll express themselves, and then the words could be written down and read as a story, and they can act it out. So that really comes in a lot of art form, like coloring and drawing out how they're feeling, coloring to music, getting up and moving. Um, there's all different ways to do it. It's scaled down a little bit more for the little ones, and the older ones become more expressive, especially the teenagers. They have a lot to say. They can do their own writing. They can write their own scenes, their mm-hmm. own monologues. Um, and you'll be surprised how much comes out. They're working off each other. They're listening to each other. Mm-hmm. They're, they're grounded in the moment. They only have that moment, so they know how to stay connected, and it's something that they can teach their parents. It's something that they could pass on. Mm-hmm. Um, now, like, Lori, um, I would like you to give the audience um, an example of a story that that just – kind of resonates with you, a story that um, you experienced when you saw a specific kid. So would you tell our audience um, a little story about something that stands out in your mind? Wow, there's so many of them. Um, but a simple one would be how that a child doesn't want to, you know, they have the weekends with dad, say, and maybe the, the, uh, the main parent is the mom, and they don't want to go with the father. For whatever reason, um, maybe they don't like the dad's girlfriend or they don't like the ha- the other house or they're just feeling like they want to be with mom. And it's it's nothing against the dad per se. They're just feeling like they want to be in their home base with, with, the, with the other parent. Um, and the other parent, now the dad's angry. Mm-hmm. And I've heard this a million times. The dad would get very angry. And next thing you know, the mom, and this actually happened to me, the mom is saying, please, you know what, come another day, let them stay. But... The other parent is like, you know what, this is my time, and they get angry, and they end up pulling the child out physically, and then it becomes a tug and a tug of war between the two with the child in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, and they feel helpless, and they feel scared, and then you have that parent driving off with your child who's angry, mm-hmm. and the other one left knowing that the child wanted to stay with them. And it's this 48 hours of fear for the child and anger between two parents. Right, right. Um, and... Maybe the child wasn't able to verbalize enough, and they're all of a sudden feeling responsible for it. That That is such a typical story for kids because um, they don't have a choice because the court says you have to go with them, and sometimes the other parents are afraid that they'll call the police or, you know, then they get involved and the, somebody can get arrested. It kind of heightens. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is why the, the children stay silent. They figure they're better off being quiet, and that lowers their self-esteem and they feel like they can't speak, they can't talk to teachers, they can't talk to their friends. And a lot of times bullying will start to happen because they're not verbal or physical even to, like, remove themselves from a situation. They feel like they don't have a choice. Yeah. Now, you brought up something very important, and that's the issue of bullying. Um, Many years ago, I worked with Charles Grodin, and bullying was one of the subjects that he wanted me as a producer to um, to talk about and to uh, help him do stories about because bullying is one of the one of the things that really truly causes trouble big trouble for for a kid no matter what age so you've seen kids who have been bullied what's how would you describe how bullying affects them First of all, like some of the children will just not say anything. I had an experience with my son where they just, a lot of my students, where they just get super quiet and you don't know what's going on. And then they get angry. They might act out. Um, they might break things or take it out on other people or somewhere in their house. Um, and then, or if they don't and they hold it in, it turns into anxiety. And people don't really realize the danger of of bullying, how anxiety could build, whether now we have ways of doing it um, on the Internet or via the phone, and and sometimes parents aren't aware of it. Um, And it's constant, and the anger and the hurt and the anxiety builds and builds and builds till they either release and do something um, physical and violent, or they end up, as the older kids do, compensating and hurting themselves, whether it's cutting or, or taking drugs. Or running away, trying, I, you know, I had that experience with some of my, my students and my own child, like just taking off because right. they don't have that release. They don't have that, that mechanism to say stop, that to be able to verbalize to a bully. 
And if someone is a bully, they pick up on the insecurities that that child is feeling. They walk around with it. They sense it. Kids are smart. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Uh, Kids are really smart. Now, let's talk about the computer. Um, You know, we live in the age of technology. And um, is this... Is this a course, you know, the storm of colors, is it a course that can be offered on um, online so that um, people all over the country can take advantage of it? Yeah, eventually, yes. But what I would like, I would like to avoid that because I really want the children to have the interaction with each other and, and adults. Um, eventually, my, my hope is when the program grows is to be able to have, to train other people to do the program in person in other schools. Um, so that they get so they get the physicality and the humanness of a human being and not the computer. Um, I would hope what I would like to also be able to do is you know Skype and maybe do something like that mm-hmm. where the teachers are involved. But I, I personally, I want to be there. I want to. I yeah. know I can't be in every place at once, but I want to be there. I want somebody who understands the program, who's been trained in it, to be there. Mm. Now, speaking of uh, this age of technology, do you think it hurts kids or it helps them? No, I, I think it hurts. Um, again, I think that it's easier not to make a move to stay on your computer or your cell phone and lock yourself in your room then go outside and, and meet people and maybe, you know, and join in on a sport or join a, a high school or an elementary school play or an art class or soccer, anything. There's so many activities. Or if you can't afford it, um, if your parents can't, there's so, there's so many organizations and programs that offer free things for children that they could do, even if it's getting them out to walk or go to the park and when the weather's nice. Mm. But how do you fight, um, you know, this this – very technological society that keeps on making games, keeps on making all kinds of equipment that children just love. I mean, when I get on an airplane, just let me give you this story. When I get on an airplane and I look around, I take a look and I see children, two years old, three years old, working on an iPad. Um, now, this is, it's kind of analogous to uh, when I asked one of the um, nutritionist dietitians that I um, interview on my show, I ask them, I say, uh, well, you know, McDonald's is, kids love McDonald's. They love the hamburgers. They love the French fries. They love everything about it. It's, um, and, and she said, well, I'm, she said there's some things in McDonald's that are good, but for the most part, I mean, take a guess uh, what she said about it. Mm. Um, so then I asked her, I said, well, you know, can't you have a campaign where you talk about how, bad their diet is when they eat in places like that and her answer was how do you fight them they're big they have they have strength they're they're constantly um doing commercials that um get people interested and they do so many other things so i i kind of use that as an analogy to your situation you know how do you fight um, I just, I disagree. I, I think you have to keep talking about it, and parents have to be responsible. Being um, a music movement teacher also and in, in working in preschools, I see the parents hand them the iPad. Um, the same thing with the McDonald's and the chicken nuggets, um, unhealthy food. They have to be strong enough to make those decisions for them when they're little so that they they know what healthy is. Um, my son only drinks water. He doesn't drink soda. He doesn't drink juice. And he's been like that because I never had it in the house. Mm. If you have it there and you say, would you like a glass of water or would you like a glass of Pepsi? Of course they're going to go for the Pepsi. It's loaded with sugar. You know, you have to, you can't give them choices at that, that, that age. And when they're teens, they can go out and hopefully make choices. But at that point, they're conditioned. It's the same thing with being in the process of divorce. If you lay the groundwork, if you give them the tools, um, if you give them the love and the consistency, they will will understand that they are safe and mm-hmm. that no matter what, mom and dad are going to be there for them, or maybe it's just mom and grandpa and grandma, but they know that they have the family stability. And when they feel safe and they feel grounded and things are consistent, they know what's coming next, they're going to feel safe in the outside world. But if they're watching a, a parent fall apart, and I know this from personal experience, they get scared. Mm-hmm. They act out. 
they get in trouble in school, their grades get lower, and they're going to eat the bad food. They're not going to go for the apple or the orange or the salad. They're going to eat the other stuff if they do have the ability to eat it in school, if they yeah. didn't get a packed lunch. And I think we're all responsible for that, too. I'm hearing all these stories how kids are being turned down for food to eat a healthy meal. Mm. Every child should eat healthy, get enough sleep, have two parents that love them no matter what the situation is, and be able to get an education. Hmm. But I really believe that the parents today, and I'm not saying because they're always oh, blaming the parents, but so many of us are overworked, we're tired, and we hand them the iPad, we turn on the TV. And uh, for me, <laughs> it actually was devastated because um, I dropped a bottle of water on my son's computer, oh. which was a gift from his dad. And he hasn't had it for a week. Um, and he's been doing more reading. Mm -hmm. He's been doing more homework. He's been playing his guitar more. And I was first devastated that this happened, sure. you know. But in a way, it's a good thing. Because mm -hmm. um, you taught him. You taught yeah. him that he, there are other things right. that he can do. And sometimes those other things are just so valuable. I mean, yeah. isn't, it, isn't it interesting that here we have the computer and yet right in our backyard – our beautiful trees mm -hmm. and nature and all kinds of things we can we can experience that really are very special but unfortunately it's trying to fight the system but i like what you said i think that it is important for the parent to um set standards to um to let their children emulate some of the things that you experienced as a child at least I did. Well, I say to, I say to my son, you, I look at him, I give him the warning. I said, you know, on a weekday in the school, I mean, he's 15, so he could stay up a little later. I give him the warning, starting at 8.30. I'm like, you have another half hour to an hour with your phone or computer. Everything else, as long as homework is done, is gone mm. at 9.30 at night. And he knows it. Mm. Um, and it gets taken away. And um, he accepts it, Lori? Yeah. Does he, he, he'll still fight me sometimes. Sometimes, oh, I still have a lot of homework to do. So I'm going to give him an extra 10 minutes. But if I go in his room and I see that he's, you know, watching YouTube videos, which seems to be an obsession, um, no, it's enough. And I'd rather that he'll come in rather than spend his last half hour up talking about music. Like he did last night. He went on his, he played his guitar. He's in the school play right now. And he said, Mom, can I just stay up a little bit later to practice my songs? Mm -hmm. And he got a part in the school play, so he was doing that. Um, and he did. He actually took the Xbox to his dad's house because when he, we're together, we usually talk. We don't have the fancy house like Dad has and all the mm -hmm. extra things. It's just us. So he doesn't sit here and play video games. We talk. We go places. We go for walks. We go to the movies. He comes food shopping with me. It's those little things. And honestly, they really want that. Even at my son's age, where he's a little more embarrassed to be with me, you know, you don't want to see a 15-year-old boy with their mom, mm -hmm. he wants that. He even says that he says, I, I just want you to listen. I just want your attention. That's all I want. You don't have to cook me fancy food. You don't have to do this. That's all I want. He always says it. That's but he great. was taught to verbalize. We're both actors, thank God. And um, I watch it in my own son, and I always say to people, I got through this because of the technique that I had and the grounding that I had. And as an acting teacher, I've always wanted to share it with people. And I tell people all the time, I watch my students, even if they're not going through a divorce, low self-esteem, they can't look me in the eye. Three weeks into the class, they're a different child. Mm -hmm. This stuff works. But as, as parents, um, we have to do it together with our teachers with whoever else we entrust our kids with. I have parents who sometimes walk in the room, don't even I come, talk to me, meet me. They leave them and they they go. Yeah. They don't even know my last name. Well, that's an example of what's going on, but you're you're an, an inspiration, Lori. You you set the standards that are very important for our children and for society in general. So I want to thank you for being on my show. Now, you have this um tell our audience what you're doing now and what you'd like them to know um is something that would help you out. Um for example, um tell them about the Storm of Colors, <clears throat> your your first book and what are you doing now that you want our audience to know about? Well, Storm of Colors is a book about a little boy stuck in between two divorcing parents. It is a children's book, but it's also relatable to adults and, and older children, teenagers, and college also. And um, I want everybody to read the book because I want them to also see the pictures in it of what the child's going through. And I want parents to do the best they can to co-parent and know that there's a whole new family environment 
um, that could be fun and exciting and keep the child protected and know that they're loved. It's so important not to give up. I I know that they can be angry and upset with each other, but if there's one thing that I could say today is remember that one time you loved each other. Mm-hmm. Bring that back. And if you can't let go of the anger, keep your eyes on the prize. Those beautiful children, remember that it's whatever you're feeling, magnify that by a thousand. That's what they're feeling. What is your website, Lori? Uh, tell our audience how to get in touch with you. It's uh, www.actingoutloud.net. Well, there you go. My guest today has been Laurieann Davis, who is a very inspirational woman. She's the author and divorce advocate who lives in New York with her her son, who she's done a lot of great things with. So I think there's a lot to learn from Laurieann Davis. So get on her website and read her book. It will help you if you're dealing with children who have problems. And I want to thank you again, Laurieann Davis, for being on the Susan Brender Show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Susan Brender Show. To be a guest, email sebrender at yahoo.com.